name is Jessica Johnson. I am an education program coordinator with the Ecological Society of America. And you're here today because of the topic, safe and inclusive field research. How can the proposed new NSF supplementary document help achieve this goal? So before we jump into it, I'm just gonna go over the water cooler chat process. It is an informal discussion where all ideas and experiences are welcome. So we really do encourage your feedback, whether you uh, raise your hand um, to be called upon and you can unmute your mic at that time, or you can mention um, what you would like to talk about in the chat box. Um, if you are not speaking, we just ask that you keep your mics muted to prevent all that feedback that happens. Um, but as I said, keep posting the chat box throughout. That's highly encouraged. We have several people here today that'll help monitor that. Uh, we are recording this event. So if you would like to review it, it will be posted on our ESA water cooler page later on. Now I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I wasn't telling you about some upcoming events with ESA's education department. Uh, we do have our ESA annual meeting that's occurring in Montreal from August 14th through the 19th. Um, and one of the awesome events that education department holds each year with our education section is the Resources for Ecology Education Fair and Share, or what we like to call REEFs. And we are currently seeking abstracts for presenters to present a teaching module uh, that's focused on active learning and can do it in hybrid environments, so virtual or in person. Um, and we like to see those uh, abstracts at any stage. So even if you're in your early stages and you haven't even implemented it in your classroom, we still encourage you to submit an abstract. Additionally, we have an upcoming uh, faculty mentoring network, a biodiversity one that's jointly um, uh, led by Transforming Ecology Education, which is an RCN, that is related to the Four Dimensional Ecology Education Project with ESA and the Biodiversity Literacy for Undergraduate Education, or BLUE. Um, so we are seeking people to apply to that fac faculty mentoring. It's gonna be over fall 2022. And I will drop links in the chat box about more information for REEFs and the Biodiversity Faculty Mentoring Network in a moment. But without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Kari O'Connell, who's gonna be our moderator today. And Kari is from Oregon State University and also the PI for UFERN, which is undergraduate field. I got it. Oh, you, got it. you got to do it. Thank you. I, I had it earlier. Yeah, that's that's awesome. good. I'm, that's awesome, Jessica. Undergraduate right. field experiences research network. Awesome. Take it yeah. away, Kari. Yeah, yes. yeah. Thank you, Jessica, for that awesome introduction. Um, so as Jessica, well, Jessica introduced me already. I will say this, I work at the STEM Research Center at Oregon State University. Um, and um, a lot of my focus is on uh, building inclusive and student-centered undergraduate field experiences, which is the focus of the UFERN network and kind of the reason why we're here today and um, knew that many in the UFER network and of course Ecological Society of America and beyond, hopefully seeing lots of geosciences colleagues here as well, would be really interested in this topic. And I have several people who are here as co-hosts to help provide some perspective and expertise. I'm going to share my screen for just a minute and then hand it over to the next person. Um, we did not practice this, but I'm sure we can. I can do it. <laughs> Are you all seeing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, perfect. And not my notes. You're not seeing notes. That's always the thing that can happen. No, I'm uh -huh. just seeing. Okay, your perfect. Here. Okay, yes. So as Jessica already mentioned, we're here today to talk about the proposed new supplement. Um, and we have a couple of folks from NSF to help answer questions about how best to comment on that and what the process might look like based on their past experiences. But just briefly, introducing my co-hosts um, and they will take a little more time to introduce themselves in just a minute. Um, Alan Berkowitz from Cary Institute for Ecosystem Studies and he's a co-PI with me on UFERN. Uh, we'll have Peter McCartney from the National Science Foundation, Carmen Sid um, at Eastern Connecticut State University. Um, she's the chair of ESA Diversity and Education Committee and a co-PI of another RCN which she'll probably mention, um, Erica Marin Spiota, 
University of Wisconsin-Madison and lead principal investigator of Advanced Geo. And then we have Doug Levy also from the National Science Foundation. So um, I'm gonna actually turn it over. Oh, one more slide, kind of what we're gonna talk about here. Um, Connor already did the logistics. Alan's gonna talk a little bit about the goals of our pretty informal session. And then we'll hear perspectives from multiple of the co-hosts and have a discussion and end with a quick wrap up and next steps. And I'm gonna share a slide, Alan. And I think- um, Yeah, just next slide, that's please. That's you, yeah. So, so the goals of the session are, are pretty straightforward. We wanted to bring this opportunity to comment on this change um, this supplementary doc document change that we're talking about is part of a, an overhaul of the basic um, guidelines that NSF puts out every um, revisions of every year or two or three. And, um, and embedded in that is this proposed change to, to add language requiring people to include a supplementary document addressing safe and inclusive field research. So we wanted to bring the, the opportunity to comment on that to people, um, make people aware of that and discuss how the change um, can be crafted in such a way that it's really valuable to make a positive and, and product, um, you know, useful impact on the field. Um, the third goal is to start discussing what, what would help us do a good job both writing these plans and probably more important implementing them so that in, when we do and engage um, people in field work, we, we do it in a safe and inclusive way. And finally, um, prepare us to respond in a positive way to, to this opportunity. And I guess I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna put in the chat the, the link to the um, um, place in the, the, the place that you comment is in, it's announced in the Federal Register. And if you go to that link, there's a button right at the top that says to comment. And we hope that people will comment individually. Um, the conveners of this group would like to in some, produce in some way a, a, a summary or capturing some of the wisdom that comes out of this actual discussion. Um, we're not probably gonna, and we'll talk more about that at, um, towards the end um, as we wrap up the session. Um, but we hope that people will, will take the opportunity to make individual comments as well. Uh, I just want to comment that that you know, like ten years ago, this kind of event wouldn't have been possible for many reasons. First of all, NSF didn't think to add this kind of requirement then, and the world has changed, and the awareness and concern and commitment to continuing to offer field experiences but do it in a safe and inclusive way is huge in our in in and. And we've expanded to include many fields that care about field experiences, including um, definitely on this call, we have people in biology, um, environmental science, uh, and in, in geology and other fields as well. Um, also, we have these networks that are poised to help us make both individual comments and also help us implement these sorts of plans. So the UFERN network, um, the Advanced Geo Network, it's really kind of a, an, a wonderful time to have this opportunity to help shape the way we as a community um, frame our proposals and evaluate our proposals because that's all a community process. And, and so here we are as a community kind of talking about this before the policy is even laid out so that we can have some say in how it gets laid out and, and then implemented. So um, those are the goals of the workshop and of the session. And um, Kari, I think it's turning over to you to introduce our, our speakers. Yeah, I think so. I'm gonna um, stop share. That was a reminder. There will be a couple other slides later on, but our first, um, how this goes, if you haven't been to an ESA water cooler chat, our co-hosts all have a little bit of time to comment and share some perspective. And then we'll be adding expertise and helping answer questions in the chat. And our first we're going to hear from is Peter McCartney. Um, and you're welcome to introduce yourself further than, than the very brief intro I gave you, Peter. Thanks. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Peter McCartney. I'm a program director in the Division of Biological Infrastructure. Um, I, I, the, the programs that I manage that are most uh, closely related to this group are, are the uh, improvements to field stations and marine labs. 
uh, and I'm also part of the, the working group that manages the long-term ecological research program uh, together with Doug and some others. Um, you know, I, I'm, you're all here, I'm sure, because you're curious what's going to happen uh, with this. And I can assure you that, that Doug and I are equally as curious uh, as you about how this is going to play out. Um, but, you know, that you have an opportunity uh, in, in two ways to, to provide input uh, on this. Um, the way these, these um, our components of the supplementary documents come out is there are working groups that are formed and they go through and respond to some community input and design these things and put together a draft and that's the stage right now and so your first opportunity for input is to is to respond to that that uh, call for for input um, that was that was shared with you uh, and and get some input right right from the gate but but your involvement doesn't end there the, the way these things are designed to work is through peer the peer review process um, NSF really isn't that good at setting a set of regulations on these sorts of things. We're much better off requiring that you have a plan and let peer review sort of dictate what constitutes a good plan. And so there's a few rails in the, in the draft document about the kinds of things that, that are provided, but, but there's not much guidance there in terms of what's going to be an acceptable response. And that's really going to come through the process of peer review. And I've watched this happen uh, before. I was on the working group that, that created the uh, requirement in the PAPG for the um, data management plan requirement. Uh, and we went through a similar process of, of a lot of outreach um, and a lot of, of training reviewers and PIs and program officers to think about what, uh, what's a, an appropriate guidance. And, and that requirement, the data management plan requirement has evolved considerably over the 16 years that it's been part of the process. Uh, we knew going in that some programs were pretty far advanced in terms of data management and others barely thought about it. So we couldn't set one bar for everybody to apply. And I think that you'll see that's what's going to happen uh, with this as well. Some, some programs and communities are, 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 have been grappling with this issue on their own for some time and are probably gratified to see NSF tackling it. And, and others um, need to be thinking about it, but haven't thought about it. And this will be an opportunity for them to set some community standards. But I just want to leave you with the, the, the expectation, I think, from NSF side is that this is something that the community owns and the community really works uh, with us to help set the bar. We'd like not to be the, the, uh, the official um, policymakers um, and, and the enforcers, but instead, and the reason this is part of supplementary documents is it's exposed to reviewers. And so we're going to expect reviewers to comment on these. So I'll, I'll just stop there with that sort of high level perspective on how I think this is going to play out and I'll let the next person go. And I'm, I'm happy to, to chat with people and talk about it. But I can tell you, Doug and I don't have answers of what to expect from NSF. We're, we're, we're mm -hmm. waiting to hear from you what to expect from the community. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think next up is gonna be Carmen and I have your slide, Carmen. Mm -hmm. So just give me just a second. Mm -hmm. And um, I will put it up again. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, um, let me get to it. There we go. Yeah. Does that look good? Yes. Yes. Awesome. So I'll, I'll give a little a background on my um, exposure to these issues. Uh, I've been a dean, I just retired, but I've been dean at Eastern Connecticut State University, dean of the School of Arts and Sciences for 17 years. So I've had to deal with um, all the field experiences issues from different types of departments, the uh, art, all the arts departments, all the social sciences departments, all the science departments, and uh, some of the issues also are in the humanities departments, linguistics, people, uh, all kinds of exposure to different kinds of field experiences and how do you deal with the safety of your students? We are, um, we have been chosen as a designated campus for undocumented students whose um, college education is paid by the US Green Foundation. And we've been having four cohorts so far. These are top students, but obviously uh, compromised in many ways uh, when they are out there. And, uh, I grew up in Cuba and I learned my English at a school in Cuba that was run by the British Embassy. And as you can tell, I'm pretty light skinned. So I don't encounter a lot of problems until about, they ask me what my name is. And, uh, and then, then I do have issues uh, such as going to Montreal um, 
in Canada and the passport says Savannah, Cuba, you know, Cuban terrorists everywhere. So these are things that you don't let go. And regardless of what kind of um, background you have, but our students are very, what we have been doing and what I've been doing in collaboration with Dr. Gillian Bowser at uh, Colorado State University and Dr. Maria Mariti at um, Ohio State University, we have um, this RCN uh, group grant called uh, the Undergraduate Network for Increasing Diversity of Ecologists. And we focus on what are the barriers that affect the development of the ecological identity of the student, the sense of belonging in the field of environmental fields, their connection to place where they're doing the research and so on, with a lot of uh, student focus groups. And we work with social scientists who are uh, you know, experts in this area. So that's sort of the background I'm in. And so I'm dealing just with a little piece of it here. All the students we encounter are very interested in the environment and doing, they love to be outside. They have a history of growing up with their families and working in gardens in various places in the world. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, from any kind of affluent background. They're relatively poor. Many of them are first generation. So this is, but they really love to be in nature. And then they, go on to college and uh, they encounter, if they're lucky, they encounter a situation where they they're have the opportunity to go and do um, some uh, more research oriented type of activity in the study of the environment. And there are things that they just can't um, imagine will happen and neither can the professors. We, we really, uh, are, have been lucky ourselves. And so as a result, you know, you, you don't, uh, you don't, you're not as aware of these issues, but then you start encountering them. As I said, as Dean from many different places, there are many agreements, many legal agreements associated with putting students in a field experience in a mental institution or in a social work kind of situation that are just as dangerous for anybody as it is taking them out in the field. And so these kinds of things, uh, we haven't, as, a, as environmental professionals, we haven't dealt with as much as other people have had to deal with for a long time. So how do we prevent these students from, you know, losing their curiosity and appreciation for the environment as we put them through this field experience, which they have to, learn how to do field work on their own. And it all comes down to the sense of what all the factors that affect security. And we worry a lot as administrators, we worry a lot about making sure that the people running the program are, are trained. There's training for everything, but you, you, know, you have to take them where, where the good stuff is there to study. And the good stuff could be anywhere, but if, you know, whether it's in the city or whether it's in a rural region or it's in a beautiful um, area in the Rocky Mountain region, you have to deal with what you encounter there. And so there are many caveats to remember. And, you know, these are just a few that, you know, you always, um, uh, there are many rest stops that if you see anything that would uh, seem like unfriendly to your students of color, like Confederate flags, you know, you, you try, how can I avoid that? And, you know, somewhere there are places in Wyoming that you can't avoid them. Uh, and so you have to plan, You even if your students are working in Connecticut, in Northeast Connecticut, um, they really can't go out on their own uh, because it's, it's not a safe environment for uh, students of color. Uh, and even though it, it's a rural area, but it isn't a friendly one uh, for students of color. So, and of course, you know, we hear about don't wear hoodies when you're doing field work, doesn't matter what time of the day, but you know, it just not. So these are things that, that, you know, you worry about. Keep in mind that these students already have some kind of connection to the environment. They want to feel, more uh, 
a part of the environmental professional community. And every time, so you have to get them to love it so much that they'll deal with these other issues that are, we can't, we can't take them away. We can protect them, but we can't take the issues away from those environments that we are, we're likely to go into. And that's where um, perhaps having them connect to the region that you're studying, that they're going to be studying through the cultural connections that are already there, not easily available, but can be searched in the internet. That's a strategy that I think has, uh, has intensified their ability to deal with, it, be more resilient. Well, this is a place that really was um, well-traveled by people of color and they did make an, uh, you know, an impact in the community. And so uh, I'm going to continue that legacy. Um, and, and so it makes them a little stronger, but it, it isn't an easy thing. So all the training in the world is going to help um, deal with these situations, but being aware of possibilities that are good and, and what to avoid for sure um, is what we want to instill in the um, researchers and, and in the educators um, that are, you know, who are taking students um, of various ages. And once you deal with students above 21, the drinking issues uh, become a, a bigger problem. So for a whole range of students. So uh, these are just things that um, we're dealing with in our network of, of professionals uh, is using students to tell us what we need to investigate further through their focus groups. Thank you, Carmen. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to move on to our um, next panelists. Uh, we wanna make our host, um, make sure we have time for some discussion. Um, let's see, I'm gonna move on to your slide, Erica. This is you, and I'm just gonna say, go ahead, everyone and start putting questions into the chat as they come up and any resources that and anyone on the chat, on the call thinks is relevant. So Erica, you're up. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. Thanks for the opportunity to join you all today. Um, I'm Erica Marin Spiota. I'm a professor of geography at the University of Wisconsin Madison and uh, lead principal investigator of the Advanced Geo Partnership, which is funded by the NSF Advanced Program to address workplace climate in the ecological and earth and space sciences. Um, our team is composed of ecologists and geoscientists. So this is, this is our expertise and we do a lot of work specifically on field-based. And I first wanna say that we are thrilled to see NSF proposing such uh, a plan. Um, this is something that I know the community has been asking for a while, so it's nice to see this. Um, and our team in particular has spent the last uh, five years focusing exactly on how do we build resources for the community to address field safety um, and addressing that, you know, we, we need to address issues of harassment, bullying and discrimination as part of our ethical and safety plans. Um, I have a little bit, well, first of all, I wanna point out to some resources. There has been, this is an exciting time to request this from PIs because there has been a lot of work over the last several years across the community, building exactly the resources that NSF is requesting. Um, our field page has a lot, summarized a lot of these resources. Many of them are written by black, indigenous, Latinx and other uh, scientists of color, both in the geosciences and ecological sciences, so very relevant to the field work, um, field training, field-based research that a lot of us uh, are due. And so resources on how gender, race, and ethnicity, sexual orientation, and ability shape field experiences. I want to mention that um, in addition to thinking about diversity and inclusivity, right, in conversations about safety, that I think um, NSF might consider adding the word accessibility into the, the safety plan, because we know that, um, you know, we know that issues of accessibility also affect safety. Um, and especially when we're thinking about intersectionality where we might have, you know, students of multiple uh, identities that have experienced discrimination in our fields and, and are especially vulnerable to um, you know, aggressions, harassment, bullying, or violence when we send them out into the field. So 
thinking about adding accessibility. Um, we also want to think about whether we can request field stations also include codes of conduct, right? Um, so places where researchers are taking teams with mechanisms for implementation and revision. There's a lot of research that shows that field stations that have clearly communicated codes of conduct, um, you know, are correlated with most positive uh, field research and educational experiences. We're also uh, wondering whether the um, example of trainings requested of research teams could also include anti-racism. Um, and then one thing to think about from the NSF side is how to build in some, some level of accountability, right? It's great for PIs to come up with a safety plan, um, but you know, what is the way that we can ensure that everybody on the team, including or especially trainees who are most vulnerable um, actually do have access to these resources and that the plan is, um, you know, is, is followed and helpful. Uh, a few other things is it would be helpful also to provide reviewers of proposals with guidelines on how to evaluate these safety plans, especially as we start building expertise in our community. Um, and then also, you know, since we have two program officers here and this is related to the topic, is also encourage NSF to you know, think about the safety plan in, in kind of broader efforts to make sure that you know, the most recent um, you know, notices and policies on reporting sexual harassment, other types of harassment are, um, you know, we, we can find better ways of making sure those are implemented effectively um, and include safety plans in, uh, as a way to do that um, as well. And so pointed out to resources, our website also has a list of uh, a number of organizations, including ours, but a lot of organizations um, that provide the trainings that are recommended as part of the supplement. Um, and so feel free to take a look at that. I'm happy to answer any questions about any of those resources. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um... I'm going to stop sharing so we can see each other. And I'll make one quick comment, and then we'll have Doug, our last host, share a quick perspective before we move on to fully and only discussion. Um, there were several of us who are very undergraduate focused who facilitated this, um, this water cooler chat. But we just want to you know, say that, of course, a lot of the stuff we're talking about we think is very applicable beyond undergraduate focus, any kind of student focus, scientist focused. And just wanted to, to make sure to, to mention that. And those of us on the team are several also write um, proposals to NSF as field ecologists, so have that perspective as well. Doug Levy, I don't think you have right. a slide. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm a program officer in the Division of Environmental Biology, and I oversee a bunch of the LTER sites. Um, and Really, Peter said what I would have said about NSF's perspective, and I want to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to keep my comments limited to that. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Doug. Okay, um, people with questions or comments, I mean, the chat, keep it going active, and then we'll start watching for raised hands, I guess. Alan, in particular, you can help for any of the hosts. If you see me missing people, let me know. Um, I've, there's there's a lot of people here. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, any questions? Alan? So, Corey, um, um, Mar uh, Marty Downs has a question, I think, that it'd be good for her to articulate. She put a question. Oh, yeah. Marty, do you want to? Why don't you say it out loud so you hear from someone besides us? Or there somewhere. Maybe. Marty, are you there? <laughs> Did you chat and run? <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan, was it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll read her, I'll read her yeah. question. 
um, uh -huh. you, you can interrupt me, Marty. But so, so there is um, one of the first things in the plan, um, this draft plan was training um, and kind of the recognition that getting training set up is um, can be a real bottleneck, especially if you don't have the expertise in house. So um, is there a thought of putting together a database of trainings? Um, and she, in another comment, Marty also commented that that the, the guidelines don't specify kind of who is to be trained. And so that maybe there's both a feedback about the guideline, guidelines here, but then also about resources that would be helpful. So um, I don't know, Peter or Doug, if you wanted to address this from an NSF thought, based on the question about kind of the idea of a database of resources. I know you all have provided these sorts of things for evaluation, not necessarily individual recommendations, but there are often with RFPs resources to help people with specific components of, of requirements. And is that something that would be considered for this? Well, again, I could, respond uh, by you know comparison to what happened with the data management plan which is individual divisions and programs in some cases started to develop their own set of guidelines to set the bar where they thought was appropriate to move their community forward and I, I, that's probably something that is likely to happen either either external groups like societies like ESA or OBFS or or so on, um, or or within the division level. So the division of, bio, of, of the, the, the biology directorate has guidelines for data management plans that, that push a little higher in terms of what the PAPG says. And, and that's probably a reasonable thing to expect. But again, this hasn't been discussed widely within NSF yet. And so we're still, um, I, you know, I don't have any official response of, of, of what's going to happen because we haven't really discussed it. But I, I think that's a reasonable expectation that communities that are better prepared to do this uh, will will set higher higher bars than those that haven't done. I, I would like, since I've got the floor, I'll just mention something I, I meant to, to mention before is one thing we noticed again with the data management plan is that um, it's awful easy to have these conversations where you say it would be nice to have this and be nice to report on that. It would be nice to tell people about this. But at some point, you do have to think about what, what the resources and, and effort the PIs are going to have to be able to provide that information. And I noticed it was wildly different with data management plans, whether it was an individual PI with a, with a $99,000 rapid award versus somebody who works at an LTR, which has funds to provide a data manager who can do all of that metadata. And so that I think might be a consideration is what's, what are reasonable expectations given the varying sizes of awards that people like to get through NSF? And I'll just add with respect to who it applies to, I would say uh, a first pass of that is anybody who works on your project, if you're the PI, you are responsible for making sure there that your project is safe and inclusive. And for some PIs, that'll be two or three people. For other PIs, it, it will be dozens probably. Uh, we've got some hands raised. Let's see here. Uh, Kari, can you unmute? Is yes, I just okay. did. I had kind awesome. of a challenge. I yeah. um I didn't see who was first. Michael so, was first. Okay, Michael, go for it. And then I, probably after that, I'm going to read one of the questions from the chat. There's lots of plus ones on an individual question. Yeah, thank you. Um, my background is safety. And I think this is great. Uh, this is moving forward. But what I really haven't seen is when people write plans, whether it's a safety plan or in, in this, you know, whatever kind of plan we have, I seem to see that this is going to be a last minute um, operation to get your grant in. They'll get the plan together. It'll be a beautiful thing that'll sit in a, sit on a shelf that nobody will ever see and read. Um, that's what I see a, a lot with other safety plans. Nobody even knows they exist. So my, my comment is I really think there needs to be a push from a high level at the institution that they buy into that this, this plan is necessary and how they're going to implement it. Thank you, Michael. Um, 
there are several questions around this issue. So that you, you brought up the same one that's kind of, um, I'm looking in my tiny little window, there's like a plus one to, I think it's a similar kind of thing. Um, what is the, I'm trying to get to it. Oh, I'm curious about the reporting evaluation might look like for the supplementary component of grant proposals, which, I mean, there's kind of two things, right? You're talking about, well, it's it's similar to the kind of question you asked, Michael. Um, I, I don't... Kari, can I just jump in and ask? Yeah, please do, yeah. It, I'm, I'm trying to think of the data management plan, which, which um, Peter is using as an example. I don't know if there are specific requirements in the reporting process to address how the data management plan was implemented. So whether that's a useful model or not, I guess, is that a possible way of providing some of this follow-up and accountability to have something added to the report requirements that address how was your safety plan implemented or something like that? It's a, I, yeah. That's Absolutely, a Alan. Um, and there are examples. Um, in, in fact, the long-term long ecological research program specifies uh, additional reporting requirements for, for proposals and, and reports that are a bit higher than, than what you would just expect from reading the PAPG. Um, and this is because we know that these projects have the resources to be able to comply at a higher level. Uh, the Plant Genome Research Program also has a very high set of expectations and they will hold up approval of annual reports if, uh, if data that's supposed to be released has not been released according to their data management plan. Um, I personally have watched proposals uh, sink in panel and, and be declined solely because of the in inadequacy of the data management plan. So it, it can be an aggressive mechanism, but it does take reviewers trained to look for it and comment on it and program officers that really have the, the nerve to be able to act on it. Thank you. Sorry, Are there any other? Oh, go ahead. There's, there's a hand raised by Aaron. Uh, okay, Erin, do you want to go ahead? Um, you put something in the chat too. I put something in yeah. the chat and this is kind of related um, because I, I agree with what was just stating and thinking about accountability all the way from the reporting to, well, and then before to the proposal. But if the, uh, if the, if the PI doesn't actually have the resources and the knowledge to be able to effectively put but to effectively implement it, then having whatever sticks we have in the end aren't gonna actually do anything, right? We actually need to figure out how to, how to empower the field team leaders and the PIs who are putting this together and to help them, help give them the resources to actually do a really good job. Um, and just sort of throwing it at them and expecting that they're gonna figure it out without some help and support and buy-in from them is yeah, it's going to be a struggle, I think. And so I just was curious if there's a way that that in terms of the wording or something else that we can we can do to help give them the field team leadership skills that are needed. Um, what kind of support do they need? Like, I mean, I I used to teach a a leadership and mentoring in the sciences. Um, there's a lot of things that are out there, but getting um, uh, the challenge I find is that many senior P senior scientists have been doing what they consider successful field work for 20, 30, 40 years and getting them to realize that, that their past successful field work may have worked in the past, but it actually may not be the best model. Just getting them to change their frame of reference about what is good field, field leadership is a bit of a challenge, but not an, not an insurmountable challenge. Are there any kind of answers or thoughts to that question? And then we'll move on to Sam. I know Sam has his hands raised. I'm seeing lots of ideas in the chat. It almost also goes to promotion, which we don't want to get into promotion and tenure, but some of these things, you know, are incentivized by the institution individually. So it's, I mean, I just want to put the comment out there as far as getting the word from NSF, who, you know, funding is very important to many institutions that this is, you know, a serious thing 
um, that the PIs need, you know, support on an institutional level as well. Probably beyond the scope of the supplementary document, but just a general idea. Um, Alan, let me know if I'm missing anything big. Otherwise, I'm going to move to Sam. You have your hand up? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I was the one who put something in the chat about evaluations. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, reporting. I guess just from the perspective of a PhD student who's actually in the field doing the work, whereas the PIs and people on these grants might not necessarily be doing the field work, I was curious about reporting because I feel like, um, well, I feel like NSF reporting isn't super inclusive of like certain populations and minorities. So thinking about like gender minorities or LGBT folks, there's very little work shown that, you know, we're increasing awareness. And it's like as a student who would be doing field work, who, who cares a lot about these field safety plans and really wants to see them implemented more broadly in NSF proposals, like I'm curious about like bridging that gap of like actually having change or just doing it to like show that there's a safety plan, but whether or not there's an opportunity for grad students or undergrads or people who would be reporting on these grants to actually report like concerns they have either about their PI not actually following through or other more broadly um, occurring concerns. And so I guess I'm kind of curious about like, like how like far that thought process has gone or if other people have thoughts about that. If that made sense, that was kind of a ramble. Well, I'll just say that, that at least with respect to harassment, that institutions are now required to notify NSF when there are reports of harassment. Um, and anybody can report that, undergraduate, graduate student, postdoc. Um, and I assume that it goes to the departmental chair um, and then to the dean if you're at an academic institution. But they, they know the rules. This is this is a fairly recent uh, uh, rule by NSF that harassment must be reported. All right, I see Michael's hand is up again. Yes, I do see. I'm going to call quickly in the chat. There was a question. I don't know if Stephen wanted to bring it forward. Stephen mentioned how would PI training happen, particularly if they are not the ones in the field encountering the problems and are the ones setting the group culture. Was there anything you wanted to add to that question, Stephen? Well, just, um, you know, it's it's the problem of if the leadership is the problem, <laughs> you know, where where does where does it, where, how do you intervene? Um, I brought up this idea that um, Title IX training is required by everybody but irrespective of whether you're the leader or the follower, but you know, I there are all kinds of issues with that, I'm sure. But just thinking about what what would we do, and I guess that would be a question to anybody who um, feels that they have some grasp of of what um, what we could do about that. That's it. That's all. Thank you, um, Michael. You had your hand up. Sure, thanks. Again, um, my perspective from safety, and I'm also working on these same issues, I'm on a national committee for the uh, Boy Scouts of America, is that um, the plans are in place, as, some, as somebody says, it's a requirement you must report, and that's great, but in fact, uh, the last speaker uh, brought up the, the situation where, in fact, the people in the field have no clue how to report. So that's the things that need to be in the, in these in these plans to help people that haven't really thought about this before. Um, and then all of a sudden, then the then your safety plan or, or whatever kind of plan um, can actually effectively be executed. Thank you. Um, I'm. I'm wondering if we've had kind of a mix of kind of comments related to uh, the supplementary docs, but I wonder, we had kind of like two questions. One of them was also what kind of resources um, might the community need um, to respond positively and successfully to the proposed supplement. I wonder if we want to get a few ideas either put in the chat or, um, 
more in, in conversation along those lines. We will be saving all these and putting them on the ESA website, the resources brought up in the chat. And also if the, any of the, oh, okay, I see a hand, Tom Langan. Tom, you wanna unmute? Yes, I was trying to get my camera on too, but it's, oh, there it is. Oh, there we go, we can see you. <laughs> You know, we've been talking a lot about um, the the side of of managing harassment and safety, and I think having you know some you know having um, a statement in proposals that explain how um, the entire research team, not just the PI, will be trained and cognizant of that. But the other side of it is the opportunity, right, in providing. Um, documenting how um, an inclusive research team um, will be put together if funded. And I think that there we have at least um, some opportunity if you apply for an REU, right? There's, that's an important feature of an REU um, experience or supplement is explaining how um, you'll provide, um, re recruit a, a provide opportunity and uh, recruit um, a diverse pool of applicants and select a diverse pool of applicants. And I think that, you know, having that as part of the statement in any proposal where there's field work in how a, a PI is actually going to go about in, in um, working to make sure that it's inclusive and um, diverse and provides a community of researchers is important. I think we have some models for how to do that, but I think that that making um, PIs make that commitment is important. Thank you, Tom. So can, can I follow that up real quickly with that? So, so to, this is another question for, I, I think the NSF folks, so if something like this gets adopted, will there be a ripple effect on guidelines for specific programs to say more than just make sure you include this plan, but to address kind of essence of it in more substance, especially for the programs where this is like what Tom was alluding to, you know, could, go, could go different ways and, and hopefully in very positive ways. Well, I think that's reasonable to expect. Um, and, and again, there's examples um, out there. Uh, you know, the, the larger programs, like I, I, I fund improvements to field stations and marine labs. And I ask for a data management plan on those proposals, even though they're not generating data. I ask for a plan that describes the station's overall policies regarding data curation. Um, and, and I suspect that something similar would be sort of requested here. I, I, to, to be honest, I worry the most about the individual PIs that are working on small grants that aren't doing it at an established field station, aren't doing it as part of a larger LTER program. Um, and, and I think those are the people that would benefit the most from societies or organizations doing something to help create some templates or some, some guidelines for people to know how to respond to these. Because this is what we saw with the data management plan is most individual PIs had no idea what they were supposed to put in it. Um, and when Data One produced some some tools that helped people create those, it was a tremendous uh, boost. And I imagine institutions will start building some template, you know, plans because their PIs are going to ask for them. If they're going to be competitive, they're going to have to be able to provide these. I'm going to see if there's other hands raised. Um, John, John has his hand up. Oh, okay, great, John. It's not a question as much as a just bravo to everybody for being here and doing this because um, I do think that we probably have a lot of, I mean, there's a bunch of resources that are being shared. I think this effort is really important that we can share information, that we can learn from each other and that we can, as somebody said, like keep having, I think Nathan, keep having this be like a reiterative process where we are acculturating ourselves about safety. Um, so just thank you.
Um, I'm looking to see what questions I'm missing here. So, in the so Wilfred, Wilfred brought up uh, the comment that none of the, there's also the ethical responsible conduct of research, which was an even earlier expectation added to RFPs. And, I, and that Peter's been talking about the data management plan. Um, there's also the postdoc mentoring plan, which is a, a, a recent addition. And I'm, I, just as, a, as an academic, I'm curious, if somebody could maybe help us by pointing us to some research about, I mean, has anybody studied the impact of those additions? Has anybody within NSF or in our community studied, you know, 20 years of required responsible conduct of research? Um, did it, what worked, what didn't work? So anyway, that's just a, it's a concrete idea for something that could help us learn from these other examples. So Erica, Thanks, you're Alan. a panelist. I think Erica. Erica. Yeah, Erica's next. Yeah. yeah, and then we might, well, we have a couple more minutes before wrap up too, yeah. Sure, thanks. Um, and Alan, I don't know the answer to your question about research on those components of NSF proposals, for example, but there's a lot of research on, you know, what types of trainings are effective and also whether codes of conduct are effective or not, specifically related to harassment and specifically related to fields. So I think there's a lot of evidence that safety plans, if they're done well, agree they need to be communicated so everyone on the team knows they exist, right? They need to have teeth in them, they need to be revised, they need to be living documents. There is evidence that that can be an effective tool. Um, I also want to share that it can feel overwhelming because so many of us don't, you know, did not have or do not have expertise in this through our training, right, as scientists. But there's the community has been working on this for years. There's a lot of information out there already. There are already sample codes of conduct. You could, you know, there, there's lots of trainings that are actually geared specifically to ecologists or field-based scientists. Um, you know, a lot of them are free. A lot of them are pretty inexpensive. A lot of them provide offering, you know, provide trainings at your conferences. A lot of them are virtual, so they're really accessible. So there's a lot of information out there. So um, I think we, I love that, that we're sharing. Um, you know, we're happy to post more on our website, spend some time on the Advanced Geo website. We've spent the last five years collecting these resources from the community. Um, and, you know, if, if you want to, if you want to post your resource on there too, send it to me and I'm more than happy to put it on there. But there's a lot of really good, useful information out there, which is why the timing of this could not be better, because I think it's going to be really, really, really impactful. I'm really excited about the positive impact this can have on our community. Thank you, Erica. I agree. <laughs> um, I think, uh, Michael, one last comment, and then we'll do a couple minutes wrap up, I think. Yeah, just a perspective. Uh, what I've seen over my 40 year career doing this is you know, in private industry, when you had to do something like this, they would outsource, hire professionals, and actually put together a program that worked. But the stick is they would get fined from regulatory agencies, big fines. So in academics, what, what I've seen is we, we have the grad student try to do this, put the plan together that has no experience at all. And it's sort of dead on arrival before it starts. There's a lot of problems. So I think we're really need to, as I said, get the culture changed from a top down high at the universities, get support, tell the people they're doing it, get resources to do it. So you can ha actually have a nice plan and support that will, um, that'll move forward and be successful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share just one last slide, um, continue putting things into the chat. Um, questions, ideas, um, they're amazing, keep them coming. Let's see, share screen one last time. Oh, shoot. Well, okay, I'm not gonna share my screen because for some reason I can't find my PowerPoint and I won't waste everyone's time. It really wasn't anything that that was that amazing. Um, I just wanted to follow up that the as far as wrap up and next steps, 
um, the resources and recordings will be posted on the ESA website. And I don't know, Jessica, if an email gets sent out to everyone who was on this, or if you just can go back and look in a week or two, um, maybe you can answer that question. Um, does an email get sent to the participants? I don't typically send an email, okay. but okay. You, okay. I can. No, no, it's okay. Okay. Start okay. On the yeah, no, 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 no. So come Give back me and like look. two weeks. And yeah, then yeah. there'll two be weeks, a page. Come up. back and look. I will also try, at least if we're on the UFERN website, UFERN listserv, I will send it out when it comes and that will help. Um, we encourage all to send comments to NSF. Alan, um, would you put that uh, link that you had one more time in the chat so it's like super accessible? to people, because it's due, by the way, June 13th. That's probably an important thing to know. That's why we squeeze this one in, you know, really quickly. Um, I'm gonna put the, uh, how to sign up the youth and listserv in the chat as well, because we'll send all this out and let you know. Um, and then uh, I hope that if, if and when, whatever it is, the settlement gets, um, Adopted. I think there's lots of people waiting in the wings to jump in. The RCN, the advanced geos, the multiple RCNs on this call um, will do some follow up work on support. So just be watching for that. Um, is there anything else that I'm missing, Alan? I think you had a couple things. Well, there's too much in the chat to, to say that you're not missing something. <laughs> right. Words, yeah, there's, exactly. There's I'm a more ton of yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, and and I think that we're we'll. I think it's we're gonna we should try to send if we do come up with a collective or, or some sort of group statement, Kari and a few of us that we if there's a way to share it with this group that would be great. Yeah, I think um, we it's talked about be, wanting. Go ahead. It's not going to be a consensus document, but just to to yeah. in, in some way. You know, share it out. Yeah. Erica, if you you could put your example one in the chat, that might actually help people think about how to provide comments. We're going to follow on Erica's example from uh, a comments that Advanced Geo uh, leadership made um, in a situation kind of like this and the conveners of the call, of course, minus the NSF folks, they can't probably give comments to NSF, are going to try to write um, maybe a shared letter um, comment that has, you know, some basis in these conversations. There's not enough time to really get the consensus that Alan talked about, but we really encourage you all to also um, provide comments and to reach out with us um, for any questions. Um, and I think that's, I think that's about it. Yep. It looks like Erica gave an example. It might be great to look at as far as example way to provide comments if you want something besides a blank page. I just want to really thank all the hosts who jumped on this with me really with short notice. So a big thank you to everyone who's here and also to Erica and Peter and Doug and Alan and Carmen. And I hope I didn't forget any of you. <laughs> so thank you. And thank you to you, Kari, for organizing this. Yeah, no problem. Great. Really, really uh, great. Yeah. I'm going to stay on host if y'all, if you have two minutes to catch up, but if not, I totally understand. Good to see everybody.